<laughs> Pray over the offerings coming up, guys. Good. I'm supposed to be the guy that doesn't let you bring drinks into the church. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you have to have water at the pulpit. And coffee. Vodka? <laughs> <laughs> and another water. <laughs> Just for those of you that don't know, when we first came to church here, there was a church here before, and they brought drinks in and ruined the carpet. And the person in charge of the school didn't realize there was a church change and came and accused us and wanted us on our like second Sunday to pay for the whole carpet. And it's like, no, 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 we're, we're new here. We didn't do the damage. That's why you see the signs and the words, no liquids in the church. <laughs> morning, Lord. Uh, we come to you this morning on this uh, uh, beautiful, wet uh, Sunday morning. And uh, we just ask that uh, you would bless everyone here, Lord, and uh, that you would bless those that are at home. Uh, there are a few people at home that are, are sick and couldn't make it, Lord. We just ask that you would be with them. Heal them up, Lord, and uh, just bless them and uh, whatever they're doing today. Uh, we ask God that you would speak through Pastor Brett today as he goes forward and gives your message. And uh, we just ask that you would bless all these tithes and offerings and that they would be used for your will and your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good? Okay. Well, we're going to continue our series in the Minor Prophets. And we did the introduction to Nahum two weeks ago. Last week, of course, was what? You already forgot. Mother's Day. Yeah, happy Mother's Day again. Ladies, every day should be Mother's Day. Amen? Yeah, you do so much. I knew I did name them from the ladies. Nahum is a very important book, even though it is small. It uh, really only has about 47 verses, three chapters. Uh, there are things in Nahum that apply to you and I today as we look ahead to what's going to occur in the last days, the end times. We believe that Nahum uh, is important because of a few things. We know that it was partially fulfilled back in 612 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar uh, and the uh, Babylonians came down and uh, really conquered Nineveh. But it wasn't completely fulfilled. And oftentimes in end time prophecy, we have a shadow fulfillment that is historically uh, fulfilled. But the complete fulfillment of that prophecy won't be until the end times or the last days. I think we need to find where that occurs. And we're going to do that. In fact, we're going to see this morning that a lot of the events in the book of Nahum will be occurred at the breaking of the six and seven seals. And so we're going to look at that this morning. In the book of Nahum, there are a lot of stylistic and conceptual comparisons to the book of Isaiah. In fact, many scholars have said, well, Nahum just got a scroll of Isaiah and copied some things. But we know that God speaks in stereo. You ever experienced that? I don't know about you, but when I am trying to determine God's will in my life, and I'm praying for an answer, and I'm asking God to show me what He wants me to do and what decision to make in my life, I may hear a pastor on the radio, and he may touch on a verse that God was pricking in my heart, if you would, uh, to help give me direction. And then my wife may say something, and that will bring the confirmation, and God will bring it all together stereoistically. That's not a word, I just made it up. But I kind of like it, stereoistic. Nahum chapter 1 verse 15, uh, Nahum really uh, and Isaiah really talk about the same thing and it's really the same event. In fact, Paul in the book of Romans used the same quote and it says this, Behold, on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news. You're familiar with that verse, right? Who announces peace, celebrate your feast, O Judah, pay your vows, for never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is cut off completely. Now, anytime we have this idea of the wicked one, who do you think it's referring to? Can be the sa Satan, right? 
or it can be the son of perdition, the wicked one, the Antichrist. Are you with me? Okay, so Nahum all of a sudden alludes to that with this quote. I just want to go over Romans where Paul quoted him and Isaiah. In Romans 10, 13 through 17, it says, Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without you? You know, we're all called to be preachers. You know that. How so? We're small. Go ahead and shout it out. Direct connection with God. Yeah. A preacher simply proclaims God's word, right? And so all of us are called to go out and make disciples. And how do you make disciples but by proclaiming God's word? How will they believe if you don't share, if you don't articulate the good news of Jesus Christ? Many Christians say, well, I just need to live a good life. But I tell you what, it's not enough because some of the best people I know are Christians. You know what I mean? And they live a good life, but that doesn't de uh, declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't make disciples. We need to do that. He goes on to say in verse 15, how will they preach unless they are sent? Are all of us sent? What's the Great Commission? Go into all the world and preach what? The gospel. The gospel. That's written to every one of us in this room. Every one of us watching on the internet. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Again, a reference to Nahum and Isaiah. Verse 16, however, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Joel chapter 2, verses 29 through 32 says this, even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness. When does that occur? Breaking of the sixth seal. And the moon will turn into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord begins with the rapture and ends at the end of the thousand year reign, the millennial reign of Christ, with the final judgment. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Where did he get that? We just read it. In Nahum, right? I mean, uh, in Romans 10, 13, but contextually he's quoting Nahum. Are you with me? Okay. So when you bring it all into context, Nahum's prophecy really is talking about this time of wrath that will come on the face of the earth. A time where all the guilty will be punished. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 13 says, Now these things have happened. The things written in the Old Testament as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And that's all of us in this room. Folks, if you have your finger to a heartbeat of end time events and world events, you know we're living in the last of the last days. You know that it's time to get serious about your walk with the Lord. Nahum chapter 1 verse 1. We went over this uh, two weeks ago, but I think it's uh, advantageous that we remind ourselves how important the book of Nahum is. The oracle or burden of Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. Remember, where is Elkish? Because he was an Elkishite, so where's the city or village of Elkish? Who remembers? How many of you have a Bible with a commentary at the bottom? Okay, if you have one, what does it say in Nahum chapter 1, verse 1 about the Elkishite? Anything? Most commentaries say, well, we really don't know where this is. It's some obscure village maybe uh, east of the Jordan River. All right. But last or two weeks ago, we went through where probably this village is. In fact, Nahum has a connection with Jesus Christ and his disciples because Christ's hometown, literally the place that he made home and the uh, 
really the, the central hub of where he ministered his whole three years of ministry was in the fishing village of Capernaum, located on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Well, guess what Capernaum means? It's a transliteration from the Hebrew to Hebrew words, and it means simply Kapar, village, and Nahum, or Nahum, the village of Nahum. Jesus Christ made his earthly headquarters for his ministry in the village of Nahum. Everybody knew that, and most Jewish rabbis say this is where Nahum is from, called back then, for some reason we don't know, Elkish. You know, maybe they had a lot of elks. Yeah. I thought maybe he's an elk hunter. I don't know. I grew up in Taft near Bakersfield, and we had elk hills up there. You ever hear of elk hills? Okay, some of you, if you're an oil field worker, you know what I'm talking about. I worked my way through seminary working up there. Capernaum really is the village of Nahum, and that's why I believe one of the reasons the book of Nahum is very important. Nahum paints a graphic picture of a strong and powerful God that stands in stark contrast to the wishy-washy kind of a genie upstairs that we have made God into today. People have lost the fear of God. I don't know about you, but every time I am tempted to stray off the narrow path, I remember that my holy, awesome, and righteous God is a disciplinarian. In Hebrews, remember we read what? God disciplines those He loves. And if you're without discipline, if you're practicing sin, and God's hand of discipline has not come in your life. It says you're an illegitimate child. You're not even born again. So the fear is this. We need to walk the narrow path. Salvation is based simply on faith in Jesus Christ. But once you're saved, you are called to holiness. Everyone in this room. The book of Nahum reminds us of the vengeful and wrathful God in whom we serve. And he will take vengeance on all those that rebel against him. Everyone. Both unbeliever and believer. For believers, it's usually events in our life where we recognize the discipline of the Lord. God is a God of wrath and discipline. But the good news is Christ paid for all of our sin on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Amen. He took the wrath that we deserve, the discipline that we deserve on the cross. And if we repent and run to the Lord, we don't have to experience His hand of discipline. In fact, usually, I like to repent when His kindness leads me to repentance. You know the song? You know the verse? It's His kindness that leads us to repentance. So, Lord. Don't you love that song? Have you ever rebelled against God and blessings begin to flow in your life and you think God's grace is sufficient I'm just going to harden my heart and continue in a life of rebellion or do you say God you're so good to me even though I'm rebelling against you and I have sinned against you and I have slapped you in the face and I pounded the nail in the cross of Calvary myself with my blatant decision to sin forgive me Lord because your kindness is so overwhelming your love is so overwhelming you may be thinking that the wrath of God is all Old Testament stuff, but it really isn't. Nahum chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 really talk about the God we serve. In fact, why don't you turn there? Nahum chapter 1, if you have your Bibles. It's after Hosea, after Amos, after Micah, and you get to Nahum. Chapter 1, verse 1, if you don't have your Bibles... First couple of verses are up there. The oracle are literally burdened. This is a weighty message, and many of the minor prophets start their prophecy out with this phrase. The burden that came to me. Let me ask you a question. Has God ever burdened your heart with a message for someone? Think about it for a minute. Maybe it's a family member or a friend, and you know you see them straying from the narrow path and this great burden comes on your heart and He calls you uh, uh, to talk to them and to warn them and to get them back on the path. That's kind of the idea. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite are really 
probably from modern day back then, Capernaum. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. Jealousy is usually not a good quality, is it? In fact, it's extremely bad. When I first got married, I was extremely jealous. In fact, even when we would go to church way back then, if my wife was back talking to a guy and smiling, after church, you can bet I'd go up and say, what were you guys talking about? I saw the way you looked at him. You never look at me like that. Is that bad? I'm surprised he stayed with me. I had to get on my knees and literally pray all night and agonize before the throne of God and He healed me. He took every bit of that away from me completely. You see, God's in the business of transformation, isn't He? At Men's Bible Study, we talked a little bit about this and God delivered a powerful message to the men that were there that God has called us to be transformed, to be renewed in our mind. Hear that depth sound? <laughs> That's my phone. I should turn it down. I leave it up because God may call. You know, I keep just in case. Is God transforming you every day? Are you growing in your walk with the Lord or have you stagnated? You see, if you stagnated, you become a pool of water that no fresh water rolls in and no water pours out to other people. And so you simply stagnate in the selfish, self-centered pool of muck. You know what I'm talking about? But as you pour out water into other people, right? God pours into you, you stay fresh and you stay refreshed. I do a lot of counseling and typically people that are struggling with depression, maybe even suicidal, I can tell you without question, they're not pouring into anybody. Their life has simply become all about themselves. God desires us to pour into people's lives. Oftentimes during the day, someone will be placed on my heart and I'll call them and say, how are you doing? Can I pray for you? What's going on? That is pouring into people's lives. That's why we need one another. Turn to Joshua. Keep your finger in Nahum. Chapter 24, verse 14. All the way back, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. You know where it's at. Joshua 24, starting at verse 14, we read this. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. A godly fear of God is really all about recognizing that He is the one that holds us in His hands. Every blessing that flows into our lives comes from the throne of God. Every good and perfect gift, the Bible says, comes down from God above. Every trial in our life, though God may allow it, comes from the enemy of us all, Satan himself. For Jesus said the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Christ came in that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Put away the gods, he says in 14b, which your father served beyond the river in Egypt and served the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers, I could say the gods of this world, and what are the gods of this world in America? Money, power, prestige, vocation. What's that? Possessions. Sports. Sports. In fact, we could say that anything that we think about more than God could be an idol in our life. could it? Choose for yourself this day, today, whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers that they serve beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites whose land you are living, the gods of America in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Men, that is a call to each and every one of us. To stand up and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. 
As for me, I'm going to serve my bride the way Christ served the church. Men, it's time to be leaders again, and we're blessed to be in a church where we have men that have risen to that call. Many churches, it's the women that have taken over the leadership and usurped the authority and the hierarchy that God has established. It ought not to be this way. Turn to Isaiah 55. Keep your thumb in Nahum. Might be hard to find again. Isaiah 55. What do you know about this passage? It's our theme verse. When we started the church, God gave us one of many verses, and this little passage was one of the theme verses when he made us start this church. And remember, he made us do it. No, God, I don't want to start a church. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And he kept inflicting discipline on me, and many of you remember the story. I ended, got to the point where I was walking with a cane. Both my legs were numb and intense pain 24-7. I couldn't sleep, couldn't lay down, couldn't set at all. And finally one night in agony, I just said, Lord, whatever you want, we'll, we'll do it. Next morning I woke up totally healed from a ruptured L4, L5 and needed surgery. Ran around the complex. It was crazy. Isaiah 55, 1. Does your version say, Yeehaw, everyone who thirsts come to the water? Yeah, mine does. <laughs> In the Hebrew, the word there is ho. The equivalent today, you can say the backdrop we have today is Western, so <laughs> I can use the yeehaw metaphor. Yeehaw. Ho. Listen to this. This is good news. Wow. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your wages for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance and that spiritual abundance, the fruit of the Spirit. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. What kind of sinner was David? He was bad. Right? Killed someone. Committed adultery. Lied. Deceived. Yet God showed him mercy and he was a man after God's own heart. Isn't that comforting to you? Folks, don't listen to the condemnation of the enemy that says, how can God love you? Look what you've done. I always say, look what all the great men in the, in the Word of God did. Yet God's mercy was powerful. And as long as I repent and run to the Lord and seek holiness, His blessing comes upon my life every time. Every time. Turn back to Nahum, if you would. Verse 2, chapter 1. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. I don't know about you, but that scares me. Do you know that God's name is Jealous? One of His names? It's in Exodus. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. Starting at verse 17. says this, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Wow, my neighbor did this and I've got to pay him back. Well, this co-worker did this to me and boy, I am going to get him back. The intern pastor threw grapes at me at Pastor Chris's wedding renewal. <laughs> I'm going to pay him back. That happened. Jacob never paid him back. He was godly. For it is written, leave room for the wrath of God. Vengeance, verse 19, is mine, saith the Lord. 
I will repay. You see, we're commanded to love those that persecute us, to pray for those that persecute us. Not to take vengeance. Not to take vengeance at all. All right. So, 1 John 3, 1 says this. See how great a, fa uh, a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called, what? Children of God. Aren't you glad? At Med study last week, we talked about how we need to carry ourselves with nobility. You see, we're ambassadors of the heavenly kingdom, each and every one of us. We are not like the people of this earth. In fact, we're told we're new creations in Christ. Old things are gone. Behold, all things have become new. If you do not carry yourself with the nobility of the heavenly kingdom, the holiness of God, that's what I would work on this week. Recognizing that you're not part of this world system. You've been called out from that. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope Fixed on him does what? Purifies. Purifies himself. Just as he is pure. In these last days, folks, God is calling us to shine bright the gospel of Jesus Christ. To allow the fruit of the Spirit to so flow out of us that everyone we talk to recognizes there's something different about us. To be holy even as he is holy. Yet many Christians today are seeking happiness more than holiness. I can assure you that when you seek holiness first, when you seek first His kingdom, what's the promise? All these things will be added unto you. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. All your needs will be met. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose for yourself today whether you want discipline and wrath or you want revival and the refreshing power of the Holy Spirit to flow into your life. It's up to you. You seek the Lord first. There's a great promise that we all have. Jeremiah 29, 11 is one. We all know it. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a hope in a future. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. All the T-books are together. It says this, for they, themselves report about, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we have with you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Have you done that? Take inventory of your life for a second. What do you think about most? What consumes your heart and your thoughts? What are you pursuing more than any other thing? If it's not God, you've got an idol in your life. Whatever you're pursuing most in life, that is your idol. That will become your God. You've turned from, to God from idols to serve the living and a true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He has raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath that is to come. Aren't you glad we're going to be rescued? I mean, we don't have to endure the wrath of God that's going to be poured out on this life. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. Matthew 6, 31-34 says, Don't worry then what we, we will eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For our heavenly fathers know that you have need of these. Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all your needs will be met. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Kind of a weird verse, isn't it? 
How many of you worry about tomorrow? If we're all honest, every hand would go up. Maybe not tomorrow, Monday. Well, I worry about Mondays uh, a lot. But maybe next year, or what's going to happen? Or will we have enough money to retire? Or how are we going to afford this? Or how are we going to be able to do this? And that worry comes. Proverbs 31, that woman is a godly woman who's managing the household. Men, you know the Bible's pretty clear about that. Well, I'm head of the house. I will make all the decisions. It's not the women in the Bible. Yeah, we're the head of the house, but they're the managers of the house. Remember, she would buy and sell property and make things and sell them while he was at the gate drinking Turkish coffee with the elders. Remember? She managed the household. She made decisions without even consulting them. Amazing. But, she, for, but Proverbs 31, back to that, she looks at the future and does what? The Proverbs 31 woman. She smiles. She smiles at the future. If you're worried about the future, I can, I can tell you right now, you need God to increase your faith. Because as you believe in the creator of the universe, that you're his son or his daughter, and he loves you more than you could ever possibly love your children or your spouse or your fiance or your boyfriend or girlfriend or anything else. He loves you so deeply. If you believe Jeremiah 29, 11 that we read, if you believe Matthew chapter 6, if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all your needs will be met. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. I know who holds tomorrow, the old gospel song goes. And he holds my hand. Wow. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. We read it already, but Christ is going to rescue us from the wrath that Nahum chapter 1 really talks about. The word wait there, by the way, means to continue steadfastly, to don't give up waiting for Christ to come and rapture His church, His bride. It's a present infinitive tense, and it literally means to keep on waiting for, not to give up or to give in, but to give it all to Christ and to trust that He's going to come and rescue you from the wrath that is to come. No matter how difficult your life may seem, He is going to come and rescue you. The rapture, Titus 2.13, waiting for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He will appear one day in the heavens. Many will look upon Him and mourn. All of Israel, when the fullness of Gentiles, will see the appearance and repent They'll look upon him who they pierced and mourn or repent and be taken to the wilderness and protected for three and a half years. Okay, timeline again. Just uh, to bring back some uh, memory of what we covered for, what, 12 weeks on the end times? This may seem pretty familiar. It should. Those that believe the entire seven years is wrath put the rapture uh, in what's known as a pre-tribulation stance, meaning the rapture could happen today, before the whole last seven-year period. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, it says very clearly that Christ will rescue us from the wrath that is to come. The Bible tells us when the wrath begins. It's just after the breaking of the sixth seal. In fact, it, we know it's so clear there that, well, why don't you turn there, Revelation chapter 6, real quick. By the way, today is usually Communion Sunday, um, but we're going to do it next week. So next week, this week, prepare your hearts for Communion next week. Revelation chapter 6, Starting at verse 15. He just broke the, the sixth seal. 
The events here, the sun grows dark, the moon doesn't give its light or comes like blood. There's a great meteor shower. There's a great earthquake. Verse 15, the kings of the earth and the great men, including the Antichrist, and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves among the rocks and the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence, literally the appearing. Same word that we read in Titus about the rapture. The glorious appearing of the Lord. Hide us from the appearing of him who sits on the throne and his wrath or the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? You see, when you simply take the Bible in context and cross-reference and interpret Scripture with Scripture, everything that you thought was great becomes very clear. In fact, there's no question. Folks, we're going to be rescued from the wrath. Why am I talking about this? Because Nahum chapter 1 talks about events that God's wrath will uh, uh, be poured out on the earth and those events line up with the wrath of God that will be poured out with the breaking of the seventh seal and the pouring out of the bulls of wrath after the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel. It's very important that we see this. Why does God's judgment come? When you read the judgment of God, the breaking of the seventh seal, the trumpet judgments, when you read the bulls of wrath, you wonder how a loving God could do that. When you read Nahum chapter 1, you wonder how a loving God could be called wrathful and vengeful and jealous. Romans 2, 5 says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath. Again, this is a specific day. And we just read in Revelation chap chapter 6 when that day occurs. We also read in 1 Thessalonians that we'll be rescued from that day. To be rescued, you have to be in what? Peril. If you're not in peril, there's no need to rescue it would be like me sailing up alongside a boat that's out there in a sailboat race. And I'm like, come on, get aboard. I want to rescue you. What are you talking about? We're having a great day sailing. We don't need rescue. But if someone was in the water drowning in the waves, being carried away in the current, believe me, they'd want to get rescued. Are you with me? I'll just tell you a story. We were sailing back when I lived on my boat, going around preaching for a couple of years from Catalina once and I had some guys I was trying to rehab on the boat and I eased the main and he was sleeping in the main cell I made it like a hammock and it was gusty winds up to 30 knots and we're trying to race the storm back from Catalina and you could see the squall line coming it was pretty scary actually and uh, he was sleeping <laughs> sound asleep in my main cell and uh, a, a swell knocked the back of the boat around and the main jived. The wind caught it. Now, I'm talking about a 25 knot steady breeze. You can imagine how much force that main slammed over to the other side and it became a catapult. And this guy that was sleeping in the main cell woke up, literally he must have been like 20 feet in the air <laughs> through about flying through the air ah! <laughs> and hit the cold water and we had to drop sail and go around and rescue him and I can assure you he wanted rescue he was in peril the water was cold the waves were high there was probably good eight ten foot with two foot wind waves on top of that folks the Greek is very clear the language is clear to be rescued you must be in peril It's another proof text that the rapture, in my opinion, happens right after the abomination of desolation when the church is indeed being refined and purified. For the day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand. The wrath begins with the breaking of the seventh seal. It's at the end of the breaking of the sixth seal where they say the day of his wrath has come. And it immediately goes into the seventh seal. All right, why does the wrath come? 
When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, Revelation 6, 9 through 11, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God because of the testimony which they maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? When's the last time you wanted to take vengeance or revenge on somebody? Think about it for a minute. I'm sure we've all had that desire in our heart. They did this to my son. Believe me, they're going to pay. <laughs> they did this to my wife. Believe me, I'm going to go talk to that guy. He's going to pay. And I'm pre preparing myself to fight him. God bless you. Bam. No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh. You see, you are the apple of God's eye, right? When God's wrath is poured out on this earth, when that day of vengeance and that fierce wrath is poured out, remember the low is slow to anger, right? Guess what right now? He is being slow to anger. He hasn't poured out his wrath yet, not at all. It is being stored up, we just read in Romans, for the day of wrath. Right now, God is waiting. At that time, the church is going to be persecuted. The Great Commission will be fulfilled. And the wrath will be poured out on all those that have pledged their allegiance to Satan and the dominion of the Antichrist, the false Messiah, who have received his mark and said, I pledge my life to you. I believe in your one world government and your system. Mark me. I'm one of the new age, one world whatevers. And they're going to pledge their life to literally Satan, and they, once they receive that mark, are damned to hell. But it is they that will wreak havoc on the church. And though the gates of hell will expand, the Lord Jesus Christ said they will not prevail. The church will be victorious. The bride will be that bride without spot or wrinkle. There'll be no denominations then. We'll all just be born again believers, Bible believing Christians that are sold out for the kingdom of God. His wrath is going to come upon those that deserve it. Joel chapter 3, verse 2 I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And then I will enter into judgment with them on behalf of my people and my inheritance Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and they have divided the land. That's what our peace treaty is trying to do right now. Partition the land of Israel. Divide the land. This valley of Jehoshaphat battle is one that's not talked about too much, but it begins the wrath of God on this earth. It happens right after the abomination.